I'd like to call to order the Middletown City Council work session on a homelessness response uh, for Thursday, February 25th, 2021. Can we start with a moment of meditation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance? Ms. Gank, you please call the roll for us. Ms. Vittori. Here. Ms. Nanny. Here. Mr. Moon. Here. Mr. Mulligan. Here. Mayor Condry. Here. Okay. Uh, Ms. Cohen, do you plan to kind of run the show for I'll us? I'll facilitate if I may. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I um, wanted to give you a brief idea of what I hope to accomplish. Um, first, let's start with a few introductions. You're going to be hearing today for, first from myself um, discussing what we get to the scope of the homelessness concerns in Middletown. And then I asked some extra agencies to be here to help give you their perspective and what they've seen in their respective um, jobs and expertise areas. Um, you're going to be hearing first, uh, give me a brief from Steve Burke and be able to speak on behalf of Middletown Police Department. Um, Steve Longworth is here, and I believe we'll be joined by Judge Sharon if he's able to later um, about Middletown Municipal Court and what they've seen in the um, defendants in the courtroom. Uh, we also have Mindy Muller here of the Butler County Homeless Coalition to discuss what their um, organization does. Uh, we also have Brandy Slavens and representatives from Access Counseling um, who have been working here um, doing counseling but also working on an engagement day center um, in town at the Gathering Church, and you'll be here to talk about their experience. And then we have Victoria Hensley of One City for Recovery, um, who if we choose to move forward with the MOU will be um, the person who is going to be working in Middletown. Um, so that's a bit of where we wanna go, who's here today and where we wanna go. Um, prior to getting started, uh, I just wanna, a few things. This issue first arose in the fall of 2019 um, with a discussion about homeless people who are congregating. At that time, it was particularly um, related to the downtown business district. Um, there was Colin, the, your microphone is really far from you, and I'm just wondering for records purposes. Thank you. Thank you. Usually I speak loudly enough, but go. I guess the mask will do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the concern at the time was um, homelessness congregating downtown, but also a concern about um, if persons were actually from Middletown or whether this was a problem of other people being brought to the area. Um, we had some discussions about it, and the issue came to light again this winter as the Shalom Network suspended their operations for the COVID environment and more people were experiencing financial hardships and uncertainty due to COVID. Um, and there's been some increasing concerns of homelessness in the area. Sorry, we first had a workshop on it in 2018, just to circle back a little on how long we've been talking about this. Um, there was a workshop in 2018 that first came about, I think in the fall also, because of concerns from downtown businesses and people being dropped off. Okay, I, apo I apologize, came I left back that around in the fall. I apologize, I left that off of here. We'll make that note. Um, this is the last time it has arisen since that fall of 2019. Um, in that fall of 2019 time, City Manager Adkins at the time um, did some information gathering for council. Uh, Mr. Mulligan did ask if we could take some time today to um, review that last set of information. So what I have next is some of the report that was presented to council on October of 2019. I believe Mr. Mulligan, if you'd like to um, take over from this point and you let me know when you'd like me to move slides forward. Certainly. Yeah, thank you for, um, I, I, I know we have some new council members and it's important to figure out, um, you know, some background pieces. And this snapshot in time occurred October um, of 2019. Uh, there were some significant city resources that were put into investigating the scope of the homelessness issue in, in Middletown. So there were multiple members of the Middletown PD that were assigned tasks. Um, Major Burke, now Chief Burke, uh, visited home, all known homeless sites during this week throughout the city. Uh, Major Reeves utilizing detectives to drive through and identify the, any homeless on the streets. Um, nuisance statutes were, uh, were dealt with through Major Warwick, Major Hood possibility of using jail inmates, inmates to come downtown to clean up uh, 
any areas, homeless centers uh, where they're congregating. Next slide, please. So through all of that, and again, this important, through this eight days of patrol canvassing, uh, our police department identified 16 homeless people located throughout the city. 16 homeless people located throughout the city. So we, knew, we do need to keep this in context of a city of 48,000 people, the, the, uh, the, the incidence of homelessness. Now, that's not to say that I'm trying to minimize this issue of a business owner or a homeowner feels that he or she is uh, threatened or feels unsafe because of a homeless visitor or, or theft or, or whatever the, the situation might be, that's not minimal. That's not a small issue. That, that goes right to the heart of what we are to provide as a city, uh, safety and security. And if, and if our residents and business owners don't feel safe, even if it is just 16 people or fewer at any given time, um, that, that's a problem. And I'm glad we're, we're talking about it, honestly. And I, I love having the, the dialogue with, with agencies outside our jurisdiction as well. You can see from this report from October of 19, uh, about half were Middletown residents, um, and then others were from outside of our city. And we're not sure where, where some of them came from. Next slide, please. So this was the um, report of calls for service for the first, we'll call it the first nine months of 2019, 46 calls during that nine month period of 2019, 17 in the downtown or Main Street District. Um, and I, I think this goes to, I think what the prior city manager, his frustration was he can only deal with a problem if, if, it's, if it's trickling up to him and he's aware of it. So 46 calls over the course of nine months. It's not, it's not zero, it is, it's something. Um, and I think our, our police can only operate as they are informed of these issues. So if, if people, if, if business owners or homeowners are dealing with, with homelessness issues, they need to report them to the city, to the police, and you know, get this into where it's a quantifiable number. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is just a, uh, a letter, or an email that, that Mr. Atkins sent out to downtown business owners. Next slide, please. Soliciting service or soliciting uh, feedback, calls for service, anything uh, video or, or, or photographs or anything that would be helpful to the police department to identify uh, homeless behavior. Uh, also to identify if there are other jurisdictions who are dropping off homeless in Middletown. Uh, how can we deal with that and quantify that? Next slide, please. Uh, this is one that where uh, the former location of Hope House on, on South Main Street, not a random um, occurrence. This was all done by the book, I believe, where a Hamilton, um, a Hamilton labeled police car was dropping off someone, some resident at Hope House. Next slide, please. Um, this is just, I think, vacant housing. Again, vacant housing is something that it is a magnet for homelessness. So we just, that, that's part of our toolbox. We have to be careful about letting um, residences or, or, or vacant buildings, commercial or residential, fall into disrepair and create that uh, situation. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, uh, again, I, I, don't, I don't have Mr. Adams' notes related to this, to this video, but to this slide deck, but um, if you would go to the next one, please. Uh, we can skip this one. Skip. Skip. Um, the day shelter was thrown out as a possibility. At that point, council, I think, pretty much rejected it. Um, the consensus was to reject it because we felt like we had had uh, put adequate services in, you know, having two homeless shelters in Middletown um, and adequate uh, agencies supporting that we did not want to do a standalone day shelter. Um, if anybody else, Mr. Moon, if you have different recollections or Mr. Tory. Uh, I have a few thoughts. First of all, I really don't want to go back through this presentation because I found it to be littered with problems. I think the first of which I'm just going to mention two. One, anybody who works in town knows there was more than one homeless person. And I talked to many people that were involved with the data collection 
And I think everyone agreed that 16 homeless people in the entire city of Middletown was not probably an accurate number. Two, the reason for the low tags, this is just another point to discuss, the reason there were so many calls that were, because there is no tag for homelessness. So when people call, because my husband and I probably called 17 times in that time period, which is why I know that number's wrong. And when I dug deeper into it, there is no tag in our system when you call 911 or when you call whichever number that they put homeless issue. They put disturbing the peace. They put all these different tags on it. So these very low numbers, in my opinion, were kind of intended to be that way for other reasons. So I just wanna make sure we're clear on that. And in terms of the day shelter, the last thing I'll say is that we talked about trying to work with the county um, to see if there was something we could do more collaboratively in Butler County. So after this slideshow, I think is when I reached out to Cindy Carpenter and met with her. So I don't think we were against a day shelter, maybe, yes, Middletown, but I think we all realized the value of a day shelter, perhaps if we could do it with the county in some location that served larger Butler and Hamilton issued places like ours. You know, a valid point, uh, Ms. Vittori, about the, you're right, the, the tagging for the, the homelessness, I, you know, I, I don't know, um, but th th this is, again, is, is, is the background just for, uh, for what we have today. Um, anything else? Did, any recollection? No different recollection than it. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so this this again um, was prior to the groundbreaking and the and the building of the Hope House on um, Grove Street. Um, Fifty temporary shelter beds, thirty permanent apartments. So that's eighty beds. Uh, I I don't think that this. I don't think that that number includes the uh, women and children's shelter uh, operated by, by Hope House either. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, and I think that would be, is there anything else in that deck? Um, it just describes some of the other options that we did chose not to pursue. Oh yeah, go, go, go one more. Uh, yeah, the downtown cameras that got no traction. Um, and then, uh, next, yeah, well, the community orienting police unit, um, this is something that we did look at and we have implemented in 2020 uh, with the federal grant. So um, the COP unit will provide ongoing task force to deal with problems that are statistically insignificant, but acutely a problem for the residents or business involved. So that, that's one lever that we did pull. Um, next slide, please. And this discusses the, uh, I'm sorry, go back one. I, I believe the COPS grant that we implemented in 2020 provided for two officers. Correct. This, this, this listed three, but uh, we have two uh, assigned to that now. And we didn't have to reduce paving, which was good. So next slide, please. I think we're getting to the end of the... Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I will mention, again, um, this is always a, a, a tough time to, especially in, in the COVID-19 environment, it's a tough time to ask more of, of downtown business owners or property owners to get involved in a special improvement district. This is something that's been in place in cities like Hamilton for a long time, but it does provide another layer of security, things like snow plow, litter removal, things along those lines, but it does come at a cost to the business owners, the property owners, because um, this would be a way to fund that type of thing if we felt like it was important. Again, I don't based on my recent conversations with downtown middletown incorporated i don't know that there's an appetite for this right now but another tool in the toolbox perhaps down the road next slide okay and then yeah so definitely some questions unanswered. so i hope that was helpful just to walk down memory lane a little bit and, and see what the uh, what some of the issues were not that long ago Thank you. I appreciated the request and I was also able to review them ahead of time, which was helpful. So thank you, appreciate that. Okay, now that we have the history lesson, I'd like to take a little minute to talk a little bit about what we believe the scope of the concerns to be now. Um, since 2019, we've had the Hope House expansion. Um, COVID pandemic has created some additional sources of insecurities as well as financial concerns. Um, so we sought some input from outside agencies and inside agencies to try and understand the scope of what we're dealing with now. 
Um, I'd like to talk first um, from the Middletown Police Chief Burke. Um, if you could either, you can sit there with the microphone or come up to the dais where there's a microphone. And if you could let me know when you want the next slide. Can I take this off? Oh, thank God. <laughs> um, first of all, I would agree with uh, Joe, some of these numbers are skewed and I think some of that is in 2019, the Hope House was still open. So we had a lot of people going to the Hope House, going to different places. So um, 16 was a very low number. Um, those are the people that we actually saw out in public causing problems. Um, so that was the number that we got from uh, Sergeant Allen that uh, did the report on that. Um, the main um, issues we have with the homeless, the three is trespassing, thefts, and disturbances. Those are the three main issues we get. So what we did is we went through our CAD system and we put homeless in, we typed in homeless, and these are all the calls that we've received for homeless. These are text messages, and this is from 2018 on, and it picks up the word homeless. But again, a lot of times they're called as an unwanted guest, a disturbance. So we put at large, so the officer may not put homeless down, so we may not be getting all the data that we need. Um, so if you can flip the next slide, we have found several uh, homeless shelters throughout the city. Um, 400 block of Curtis Street, right past the dollar, right behind the um, structures on the right-hand side. Whenever you see a tree line, there's a homeless, there's, there's a shelter, like a homeless camp right in there. Titus Avenue, the width line between 20, or 3201 and 3203. Um, Mayfield Apartments, um, Amanda School, um, Commerce Drive. So if you take Commerce Drive to Hook Field, so you take Commerce, or uh, yeah, Commerce to Hook right there, you have some issues there. There's a big um, tree line right there, right by the uh, path, the bike path and you have a large significant number of people because they go in hiding when it's cold. There's trees in there, they can build camps in there, and we're now getting calls from Hook Drive that people are walking around in there disturbing to their businesses and stuff. So that is a concern. Uh, fire headquarters, Goldman Park and the Wood Line, um, Blue Ball, uh, Terry Drive is another one. Um, behind Wilbraham Apartments there, there's a huge tree line by the bike path. There's another camp there. Uh, Smith Park, we catch them in the woods. We catch them sleeping in Smith Park. River, uh, Miami River Park, they go back there. Um, there's several commons we see them. There's several areas in the air, uh, in throughout Middletown that we see these camps and these individuals coming together. And the number has increased because of COVID. Middletown is known for services to help them. Um, we have the needle exchange program, we have counseling, we have food banks for them, um, we have shelters. So a lot of times um, Middletown is known to help and give those services to needy people. Um, just a couple days ago, we had Franklin actually dropping off people at 1300 Gerard there um, without contacting them, dropping females off, knocking on the door and leaving. So here's another case of someone homeless in another city. What are they taking them? They're taking them to Middletown. We contacted Franklin and said, you can't do this. So we're, we're still dealing with that issue on a regular basis. Not only that, but we, uh, you can flip it one more slide for me. We've had issues throughout. Um, obviously the Lincoln School, um, if you go to the Lincoln School, go to the back, there's a huge homeless camp. Uh, the AK Research Facility, this is an ongoing problem. I tried to get with an officer today, he took off, but we were gonna go in there and take pictures. There's actually underground tunnels that lead from the research building across the street. Um, they're going in there stealing copper, stripping it out. Uh, we had many homeless people we've trespassed off of there, um, but it's an ongoing problem there too. Uh, apartment uh, commercial buildings on Clark Street, and then obviously the paperboard that caught on fire on Vanderveer um, was a huge homeless area for them to go. And that's the problem. They go to any vacant um, house or building. We put these orange stickers on it when code enforcement comes around and they put these orange stickers so that to them that's a welcome sign because, hey, it's vacant, there's no one there. I'm gonna go and squat in there until someone catches me. So 
we do have an uh, issue. We have been working with uh, Holly Owens. Can you flip the side for me? Yeah, COP. So Holly Owens was transitioned to COP this year. As you know, we have eight officers retiring. Hiring new officers takes four to five months to get them trained on top of going through all the testing process. So there's a big transition period going from getting the day hired to the five months for they're ready to take the street. We can't transition another COP officer until we have um, these officers trained. We're giving another test on March 6th. We're hoping to hire four to five on that test. We still have a couple more retiring before uh, the year's out. So Holly has been working. She's been working a lot on recruiting. She's contacted Kathy Becker. She works with both Lindsay and Victoria with the QRT team. So she is out there making connections. And our goal is if we have those resources, they're more likely to connect with someone with um, services, social services, than they are with an officer. Because what's an officer doing? We get a call on them. We take the call, we give them a criminal summons, we trespass them off, or we arrest them. So if Holly goes with somebody with social services that has the ability to place them and to build relationships, they're more likely to connect with that person instead of an officer in uniform. The only things that contacts they've had with them has been negative, such as arrests, summonses, um, taking them outside the city somewhere else, so I really think by joining with a service like that, we can build better networking and better relationships with the homeless. Can you flip the next side? I think you're good at this point. You guys have any questions of me? What impact, if any, have you seen of criminalizing the activity and the repeat nature of those activities? Like, you know, if the you repeat arrest is, somebody so many times, are they yeah. are they going to get the clue, or yeah. is it is that something that's just going to and that that goes and continue and continue? That goes to the addiction problem. I mean, today we we had a known female that's homeless. Um, she was on the street corner. Uh, somebody was passing by, rolled her window down because she was like, she jumped in the window of the car. So we had to go out to that. But these individuals are drug dependent. They have mental issues. Um, so we can arrest them so many times, take them out to the hospital. We took her out to the hospital to get treatment, but after 72 hours, they'll kick her loose and we'll be dealing with her again. That's why I really think by building these relationships with the proper groups and the proper social services that maybe they can reach them and find a more long-term solution so we're not dealing with the same people over and over again. So if there was a situation where we had a partnership in that situation, how would that how would that particular situation be dealt with differently if we moved forward with this program? Well, if it was a mental health issue, which this case is a mental health, probably addiction on top of that, Kathy Becker um, would be the person we would contact. Kathy would have resources. She would get her evaluated. She would find a more long-term treatment than Middletown Atrium that holds them for 24 hours to 72 hours. And she can do the evaluation and she can say, hey, we can find a place for you here. And then after she either sobers up or is in right medicated or whatever it may take, she can find a long-term solution for her. Police officers are not, you know, we, we deal with call, the call, the call. We deal with a lot of same people over and over again. And, you know, all we do is summons them, put them in jail, take them to the hospital, and then a couple of days we're dealing with the same people over and over again. We have to think outside the box and we have to find more of a long-term solution to the problem we're dealing with. But in that particular situation, you were required to take her to the hospital. Absolutely, for her well-being, Okay. we had to take her to the hospital. But so, so this we, program wouldn't really have any effect on that if, particular situation? I think if, the difference is that in this case, when she's in the hospital, we would have made a call to the outreach team that would have been able to go out there yeah. and really okay. work with her directly. Right. I'm just trying of, to see in the different yeah. scenarios yep. that are currently happening, so, where does that team have an effect and influence, and what influence is that in so the long term? This sense? woman was being held for 72 hours. We would have made a phone call on the first day to the treatment providers and say, look, this is the situation we had. We've taken them to atrium. They're being held 72 hours. That gives the treatment provider world a chance to go forward, say, all right, go out and try and make some contact with her, build that relationship, and then talk about where they could help her get to next 
to help solve the problem instead of her walking out of H room 72 hours later, maybe being back right in the same situation. And is there a reason that we don't do that already? Because don't we already have sort of a relationship with the organization? And we do that. It's okay. just like on midnights or 3 to 11s past 6 o'clock. It's difficult to get a hold of someone. So if we actually had someone that we had a partnership with mm -hmm. and we could say, hey, we're back out at 2 in the morning, you know, who do we need to call? Because we have the same individual over and over again. And then we're hoping that those relationships build and they have more trust in those social workers than they do the police. Because right. what are we doing? We're, we're cuffing them and taking them out to the hospital for their well-being. You know, maybe they start building that, you know, bond and they start listening to these social workers. get the workers. distrust. I think that that's something that you experience if you spend any amount of time working with homeless people is that it takes, it takes a it lot does. of time to build that relationship and build that trust up with them. So I, I totally get that. I guess I'm just trying to figure out to Councilman Moon's questions over the last two council meetings, how susceptible are these people to even wanting treatment? Like how, how, you know, if that one person has been seen by the police over and over and over again, have they not been reached out to for help? Has someone not tried to connect them? They've tried and before? they may deny help. I mean, I've had, when we opened up the doors when it was real cold out for the last mm -hmm. couple of weeks, we opened it up and we had, you know, six to ten people in in the, lobby in the area like that for some time mm -hmm. and uh we'll go for it. we just uh, continue to uh deal with the same people over and over again um but they didn't they didn't want to go to shelter because we asked them hey do you want to go to hamilton you want to go to surf city no no we're fine here six o'clock comes in the morning they take off and they go do their business because yeah. a lot of people don't want that treatment but we're hoping that these social workers can continue talking to them on a regular basis and maybe get them to understand, hey, you need help, you need treatment. Police officers don't have that ability. We, we're going from call to call to call, and we just don't have the ability to find Billy Bob and say, hey, Billy, how you doing today? Do you need some help? By having an organization that can touch base with them on a regular basis, maybe they have a breakthrough. Chief? Yeah. Do you mind? Go ahead. A lot of these individuals, to speak to your point, are already open with agencies. They may also be open with probate court. Uh, one in particular that I'm sure comes to mind first and foremost is probably on your list over 20 times. He's actually adjudicated through probate court and has a guardian. That individual, your officers are going to be seeing regularly, but those other agencies cannot work with him. He's under a probate court order. He's supposed to be working with agency A, and the individual, when they come across him, has to be redirected back to that agency per the probate court's order. So some of these that they're encountering, probably the vast majority of them, whether it is mental health issues or whether it is substance abuse, are probably open with all the different agencies that you're going to hear from today and more. So having some type of resource for the officer to simply deal with the situation, but also be able to put them back in contact and reinforce their existing agency utilage is what's important with them. And to speak to your other question, if I may, and I'm jumping to a little different part of the presentation here. In my presentation, we'll talk about the habitual offender and what the appropriate action is from the court's side of it. So, sorry, didn't mean That's to interrupt right. you, no. Chief. Thanks for the help. I'm just trying to gather yeah. as much yeah. information Absolutely. as I understand. possible to see the whole picture. Yep. And I also, we'll have some time at the end of this to have some um, general discussion because I think a lot of these questions overlap between the treatment providers as well as some of the um, in-house service providers. So I think those are also some good questions to ask at the end when we're talking and having more of a free discussion where everyone can bop in because I'm sure these ladies back here are all saying, I got an answer. <laughs> Kathy's jumping up and down back there. Um, so at the end, I, I hope we can get those kind of questions through some free discussion. Sure. You guys have anything else for me? Yeah, can I ask? I don't, you're not going to know the answer probably, but if you do, great. Uh, who currently pays for the services, the social services for these homeless individuals? I mean, Kathy's going to, okay, so if you want to get to that when you, you guys speak, that would be great. You don't have to answer at the moment. I know when we do HRT or quick response team now, that is paid through from a grant that the fire department received. It pays for the officers and pays for the services of the quick response team. 
So that's all funded by that. Okay. And at some point, I'd be curious to know from the providers if they have any semblance of the percentage of success rate, um, basically turning someone who's homeless into not anymore. So if that's available, that would be great. I know that's not you. Not me. <laughs> Anything else? One question for Chief. It seemed the, um, in that list of a dozen or so places where homelessness camping is going on, I, I mean, a handful of them were city-owned property. So what are we doing? Well, we do go out there when we get calls and complaints. We don't. We check the property. I know we're having a lot of complaints there at Commerce and Hook. So we've been going over that area, getting out on foot. If we find them, we're having them go on, see if they need to go to Serve City, go to a shelter. A lot of them refuse, so then they walk on, and we don't know where they go. If they're not intoxicated, if they're not on harm for themselves, there's really nothing we can we don't do to them. The last thing we want to do right now with COVID is arrest them for trespass and put them in our jail. So we uh, we give them a warning. If we do have to take criminal activity, a lot of times it's a criminal summons. And Steve can tell you how effective those are with the people we deal with on a regular basis. But it seems like a you know clearing out a tree line would not be a difficult task. Oh no! If, I mean, when we we, uh, we tear out honey in nineteen, we went to all the homeless camps and clear, cleared them out. Then where they ended up, they ended up all downtown because, you know, they're going to go somewhere. And we can do that on a regular basis is go to all the camps and scatter them out. All they do is all we're doing is displacing them is all we're doing. And we're placing them from A to B. So um, that's why we need to have some type of solution, a long-term solution for the problem. And a lot of the people that are in these camps are the people that refuse treatment. They refuse help because of a mental or drug addiction or alcohol addiction, and they don't want help. They want to live on the street. They want, some of them even have EB, you know, cards, EBT. I know one person loves to be homeless and gets money every month. I try to get a metropolitan housing and he refused. So a lot of times they're choosing to be homeless for one reason or another. But we, kill, we still can't maintain magnets for Absolutely. Campments. I mean, yeah. Well, we can't. What, what's happened with Lincoln School is, I mean, it's it's a complete failure on the city's part. But Lincoln School well, is actually a great example, if I may. Um, we have boarded up that property, I think, on at least seven different occasions that I know of, and it continually becomes a problem. Um, we have also done some work with uh, part of the um, landscaping to try and make it less attractive to get into. That didn't work. We've been working with sending some officers through there. We continue to have these efforts and people continue to come back. We've tried fencing at different locations um, that has then been vandalized. We've tried boarding up properties that then get vandalized. So it has been a continual effort to try and keep up with. How do we currently enforce the vacant property? Because um, if you have a property that is vacant, you are responsible for... That would fall under a code enforcement. And, and yeah, so we, we don't have it anywhere but downtown. It's only in the downtown yeah. district. Oh, I hmm, okay. I knew it was downtown for sure, but I thought we had it more than. No, it is only the core business. I district. thought there's um. I thought in the fire code there is a regulation that if you, if there's a vacant property that you have some sort of a responsibility as the property owner. So, like, if we if we have a vacant house and the neighbor will call because there's a big orange sticker on the front door and we get people are squatting in there, the police will show up. We'll try to get in touch with the landlord. We'll secure the building, but it's not going to say that in three or four days somebody's not kicking the back door in and going in there and squatting. You know, with the amount of vacant properties, you know, officers just don't have the ability to go to all the properties that are vacant. Oh, yeah, I completely understand. Yeah, so... But, uh, but we do get calls on that a lot, um, vacant property, especially when it was colder out. It's a little bit warmer this week, next week. So we'll see more and more just wandering through the parks in different areas. I'm just wondering if there's not a way where there are vacant properties that they're clearly getting abused um, by third party use that the property owner, I mean, in my mind, the property owner is responsible for that property. I don't know if there's any way we can create a program that there are fines involved, and now those fines help to feed a program that we can help these people in some fashion. And 
we can certainly talk about expanding the um, vacant property legislation if that's what council would like to do. There's certainly do. some opportunities there. I don't know if that's something that you guys are interested in at all, but I just, I mean, it seems like those properties are a problem and they're creating, they're making the problem bigger. And if you're a property owner, you know, it should be your, your duty to maintain that property in a fashion that's responsible and doesn't create additional burden on our city. So that's my thought on that. That would be a big help. <laughs> all right. And I think there was some resistance at first of registering those properties downtown for the vacant property registration because that's what it requires them to, they, they had to re uh, register those properties as vacant and that way we were aware of that they were vacant and all of that. So I think, you know, anytime you get into that, there's going to be a little bit of a conversation that we would have to have with oh, property sure, owners yeah. in town and that would be a, a big issue to, to get into, but um, it's definitely something that I think we've talked about before. I mean, vacant properties are a bigger problem than just housing trespassers, right? I mean, overall, the blight that it creates is also an issue, so. Okay. okay. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Sorry for being the first speaker. You got a lot of extra questions. <laughs> Um, the next section, I just want to put in a slide or two here um, with this discussion uh, about um, where people are from um, and really to try and get some um, up-to-date data. I spoke with Access Counseling who have been working with the Gathering Church to run an engagement center during the day. Um, they do an intake process during that intake. They ask about home of origin and um, where people are coming from when they're using the facility. Um, got some, I believe these are week-long results, Brittany. Um, indicating during the week of February 15th, two people reported being from another city. Uh, one was state of California, one was from Hamilton. Of how many people? 60. Okay. Um, 45 reported their last housing was in the city of Middletown. Um, 13 reported that their last housing was couch surfing or family staying in the area. Um, just to is give that, you. Is that sort of a better number on our current count of? Uh, unsheltered people in Middletown. It does give you an idea that in any week this was the number of users in that type of a facility. And those are unique users, not repeated. I believe so. I'm um, just. This is the examples from the intake log of answers that were given. So while I think at any given point in time it's hard to put a count on people, but we try to look to some of these situations to figure out um, where we're getting people in the amount that are in town. I see in town. I mean, I could be wrong, and I'm sure Chief knows more than I do, but I know in a lot of the anecdotal experiences I had in ride-alongs and other things, the Section 8 issue is really kind of a tipping point because so many people you meet they came here to stay in Middletown, usually with somebody, and then something happens and they break up or they're not friends anymore and they become homeless. So I think we can't overlook the fact that all of our Section 8 and that large number of housing that's out of proportion is somewhat the cause for how some of these people get here and then become homeless. And again, all this will give you is what they've reported to Access Counseling. So. It gives you a, sh a shot of what we have, although I don't know if anything's going to be 100% accurate. I think this does give you some idea of what was reported. Thank you for the effort in collecting this. This is definitely helpful. All thanks to Access for giving it to us. And um, the next group we sought from input from was um, the Middletown Municipal Court. Mr. Longworth is here to be able to discuss um, their experiences and thoughts. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to uh, clarify for those that don't know, Judge Sharon just had shoulder surgery and he is currently in physical therapy. So he was trying to make it here but didn't know if he'd make it in time or not, but I do have his notes for you. Obviously the court is the place of last resort for the homeless population. We are obviously not the appropriate place for the homeless population. Getting to the root cause, all the other issues that you're talking about are much better options with the homeless, but when they do end up in the court, you were asking about some of the numbers and so forth. Judge Sharon has been seeing an increase in the criminal trespass section. 64212 is the local ordinance for the criminal trespass section. A lot of these are homeless individuals that are squatting, coming into a place where they're not supposed to be, what have you. Wanted to point out, and again, these are just to give you some numbers, speaking specifically to Ms. Vittori's question of trying to get some actual numbers that, that might be more reflective. 
of the 21, or I'm sorry, 21 of these cases actually have an at large listed as their address. That's highly unusual. When somebody's arrested, they come to the police department, they're booked in, they list their addresses at large, it's a stagnant data point. In other words, it doesn't get changed later on. For the court, that's a constantly updated field. What that means is when somebody goes through courts adjudicated and so forth, generally speaking, if they want a payment plan or they want services or whatever else, they have to give us an address so we know how to contact them. So they'll give us a friend, a relative, whoever. So to have 21 out of those cases that cannot come up with anyone to give us an address for, that just kind of gives you some of the numbers of what we deal with. <clears throat> Excuse me. The court's approach, obviously, again, this is after they've ended up in court, so they've, they've been interactive with the police and other agencies and such, but the court has agencies embedded in the courtroom to provide mental health, substance abuse, and other service information at their initial arraignment or some other point in the case that may be appropriate. In other words, if we have somebody that's truly homeless, identifies as homeless in the courtroom, we can have somebody speak with them right then and there. That's every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday when we run court. <clears throat> Those agencies we'll talk about a little bit later but that's what we have. Then we go to, of course, your veterans. Your veterans have much better services available to them. We have a veterans treatment court. It's a specialized docket from the Supreme Court. They meet approximately once a month. That includes actual representatives from the Dayton VA, the VJO, the Butler County Veterans Services Commission. And I wanted to take just a little piece there about their housing solutions program. A gentleman by the name of Clarence does a wonderful job acting as kind of a resource for us for Holt, uh, Holt House, Holt Street. I guess I should call it by the right name, but I apologize. Sometimes it eludes me. So when we have a veteran that comes in and identifies they're homeless, we can get them services almost like that. As long as they have their proper documentation, are able to establish that they're eligible for services with the VA, we can make those contacts immediately. Reason I point that out is that doesn't obviously have to be just the court. Somebody comes across somebody on the street that's homeless and so forth and they're a veteran, there's services that, that should be readily available to them if they have their proper documentation. In addition to that, we obviously then have the probation department's general services. When somebody's placed upon probation, they have uh, uh, all of our probation officers are master's level education with areas of specialties, whether those are uh, one of, I'm sorry, two of our individuals are chemical dependency counselors. The third one uh, specializes more in domestic abuse. But we have them to be able to support the local agencies and so forth for substance abuse, mental health, educational and vocational training, and locating appropriate housing. So that's kind of what we do once they've come into the court system with the homeless population and all other services. But to speak to what we were talking about earlier with repeat offenders, Criminal trespass, for those of you that may not know, is fourth degree misdemeanor punishable by 30 days in the city uh, jail. We obviously don't seek to criminalize their homeless, uh, homelessness, but when an individual is a repeat offender, we do actually jail them. And while they're down there, we may make contact with them again and again and again during their incarceration to try to set them up with those services that they were resistant to at the beginning to again try to engage them to take care of the underlying issue. Just wanted to simply advise that we, we do, when you have ignored the court's orders and continued in that behavior, we do, thanks to having a local jail, we do actually incarcerate. It's a very, very small population of these 185 cases that are habitual offenders. There's probably about six on this list of 185 that are habitual that will rise to that position. What is the typical outcome if someone is jailed for repeat offending? They'll probably are going to sit for 30 days unless while they're in there, when we have those conversations with them, they agree to finally engage in services. How often would you say that that happens? These six individuals probably never engage in services. Okay. They are a very small percentage, but they do exist. And unfortunately, they've worked their way through the different contacts and so forth, and there's not much else to do other than to punitively punish them. 
Also wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, the relationships that we have when you're talking about the SRT team and the other uh, interactions that kind of start this. We have a wonderful working relationships with a lot of the agencies that you're going to hear from today. In addition to the ones that are embedded in the courtroom, we have a weekly jail meeting in which we have all types of treatment agencies that come in and discuss with the court what we can do with those individuals. These would include the repeat offenders that we're talking about. Hey, we've tried six times to put them in. The last time was three days before his arrest. Here's what we've tried. This is the level of services they need. And this is what we recommend happens with them. We regularly work with access counseling, community behavioral health, genesis, surgers, transitional living. I'm going to screw those all up here if I don't slow down. <laughs> Victoria and Lindsay, of course, with the Hope Line. And that's just to name a few. We will use any service provider that, that you know, is licensed in the state of Ohio for their appropriate uh, care and attempt to get them in. As a side note to that, currently, in addition to the ones that are embedded in the court now, we have a waiting list of about a half a dozen agencies that want to get into the courtroom that we are currently not placing in there because of the current COVID issues and so forth and still trying to create, trying to keep the population in the courtroom low. Other than that, I don't want to take anything away from the agencies that are here to speak, so I will wait till the end and be happy to address anything you'd like. Very good. Thank you. Do you have any sort of semblance about the percentage in general of veterans who come through? How many we serve in veterans court? Yeah, well, I mean, specifically under the trespassing I do not. I can see if we can take a look at that. We do keep, because the Veterans Treatment Court's a specialized docket, we do keep those records uh, separately from the generic ones that I ran you today. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious of the general population of homeless and um, the ones running into problems in the city, uh, you know, how big of a percentage are veterans? Happy to try and get that number for you. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Another partner I wanted to make sure we touch base with was Hope House, because we certainly can't have this discussion without looking at how they're operating. Um, I spoke on the telephone with Tim Williams, who's the director at Hope House. He um, expressed his regrets. He had an appointment and was unable to be here this afternoon, um, but wanted to make sure that they're a part of this discussion and are actively excited about being able to engage in this discussion. Wanted to tell you a few things that he um, informed me of. Uh, as we know, their new facility did open in 2020 for the men's shelter. It is designed for 50 shelter beds and 30 transitional apartments. They are working on um, providing a scope of services. So looking at everything from health needs to mental health treatment facility um, needs and trying to um, look at the whole person as opposed to just, hey, here's a bed for an evening. Um, they have had issues like everybody else about building capacity during COVID concerns and being able to maintain proper social distancing. Uh, for the majority of 2020, they've spent their days at half capacity in order to be able to adequately address social distancing. Um, they are now working back up slowly in headcount as they're able to do so. Um, Tim noted that they have been full for the majority of the year. He said they do have a couple of bed beds available currently, um, but have spent the majority of the year completely full. Um, along with that, they run the women and children shelter um, that has similar problems with headcount. They were about half count when they um, ran most of the year and are now working their way back up. Um, it's my understanding now they have anything, anywhere between 17 and 24 of, um, areas that they can house people depending on whether it is single women or it's family units. Um, dip, changes that number slightly about their capacity. He did note that the space at the women's shelter particularly is difficult to get to. Spots fill up almost as soon as um, someone is released. He did also provide me some data. This is similar to, I believe, a slide that Mr. Atkins used in 2019 about the um, origin in, um, that people report in any given year. So I'll let you take a look at that. This is their numbers from 2020 and where people reported they were from. So am I reading this right, that less than half are from Middletown? Um, yes, yeah, you're looking at that number breakdown. If you're looking at the 128 and the 135, um, that's what they reported. Well, okay. I think, Sam, some of that 
I don't want to put words in their mouth, but they have relationships with other counties that when people are going through things that they would accept them in. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. I can't speak for them at also, but I wanted to provide these numbers for you. Uh, these are specifically Hope House. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, that makes more sense. Um, the last thing they really were wanting to make sure we brought to attention that they were estimating, and this is an estimate, that out of 100 people, they estimated 75 to 80 have some form of substance abuse concerns when they're being evaluated. Um, that has been a huge concern from them and being able to adequately shelter people. Um, they are very excited about a new partnership with Genesis Treatment Center in Hamilton that does ambulatory detox and being able to help pe wean people safely off of substance abuse issues so that they're more able to be addressing um, the underlying concerns that brought them to be homeless and being able to get them on a better path. Um, I think that also highlights the benefit of having partnerships with the treatment centers and the treatment providers to, in order to address this concern. Can you remind me, is Hope House, um, is, is it a day center as well? No. Well, they have, they are running only, they are running 24 seven for the people that are there. It's not, everyone can just kind of walk in. So I guess my question is, less than half of the people are from Middletown, yet during the day, all of them are released into our city? No, oh. they stay at Hope House and they get services. Okay, that's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you, appreciate it. Um, I'd like to ask Minnie Miller to come down from the Butler County Homeless Coalition. Um, just kind of here to speak again, Mindy Muller, Butler County Housing and Homeless Coalition. Just wanted to give some overview of our coalition. Um, appreciate some of the information that we've heard today. Certainly not new information to us. Um, the coalition is not a service provider. We're a, a collaborative of service providers that are operating in Butler County. And even some of the things that have been said today um, highlight some of our underlying concerns, some of the holes that we see regularly in the system. Um, trying to be, we are Butler County, but so many of the services are city-based, um, or uh, we try to keep those within our certain geography, and that makes it challenging when we're trying to work across the county to be sensitive to that and to serve well through that. Many of the providers that are part of the coalition do serve across Butler County. Um, so I think um, we try to be, um, we, wanna, we wanna serve people across the county, not really um, pay attention to the specific cities that they're in. However, we also appreciate the challenge of moving people from one jurisdiction to another and creating ongoing issues as a result of that. So it's challenging to work in that. Um, but we as a coalition are really looking to reduce the incidence of homelessness in our community. That's our ultimate mission that we're trying to accomplish. Um, we have some strategic priorities that we work under, um, really being an advocate for those that are experiencing or facing homelessness. We wanna do that, ensure there is an adequate system of care for those experiencing. We have some holes in the system for sure. Um, and so we want to come up with creative solutions, practical solutions to help fill some of the gaps. I'm making notes of things I'm hearing today about things we need to tackle, things that are um, important that we need to put some effort behind. Uh, we wanna support projects that enhance and improve the continuum of care of those that are experiencing homelessness and seek out opportunities to be part of the solution. That's why we're here, and that's why I um, wanted to, to present some information about what we're trying to do. I did include some other things. Um, one of the confusions that we have in dealing with serving people is what is homelessness? Um, if you're in the school system, you have a different definition than if you are getting HUD money. And so when we talk about just even the issue of homelessness, what does that mean? Um, I, what I hear today is that we're mostly talking about unsheltered, chronically homeless individuals. 
people that we see visibly see. Um, it's a very small percentage of those in our county that are experiencing homelessness. Um, the numbers are way higher than what we're seeing visibly on the streets. And so our system is tackling those kids that are couch surfing. Um, there are hundreds of kids that are homeless that are in our high schools. So we are dealing with issues and trying to help those kids and those students while we're also trying to tackle issues of those that are chronically homeless that are unsheltered. And so our goal as a coalition is to make sure there's a system in place so that when someone decides they want help, we can help them. I think there are a couple ways that I'm picking up even from conversation today that we could, we could advocate for um, coming alongside and doing some other things um, to help fill that gap. But we want to make sure there's a system in place for people that when they choose not to be homeless or if they find themselves homeless, we're there to support them. We want a system of care. That's what we're about, is making sure that that system is in place. And then looking for where those gaps are. So I included some things for you. Um, one of the things that I think I'll uh, point to your attention is uh, the policy on proof of residency, because this becomes an issue when we cross jurisdictions. Um, and so providers are always dealing with this issue. If they're not in our jurisdiction, can we help them? Um, what is residency when someone comes and they have nothing? They don't have a birth certificate. They don't have an ID. Um, how do we help them? And so we developed this policy um, to try and help identify what is residency. We recognize clearly in this language, we can't help everybody outside of Butler County. And so when we hear about other jurisdictions bringing people into our county, we're already strapped with resources and we want to take care of our people that are here, but we can't extend that help to every, everybody outside of our jurisdiction. So I, I understand that challenge. And so just trying to come up with what, who are the people that we're charged with helping was something that we felt like we needed to do. So you can see kind of what our policy is on, on residency. Um, the next page has a snapshot of the community synopsis. Um, every January, HUD mandates, a lot of the homeless dollars come down through HUD. And so HUD mandates that we do a point in time count. Um, it is, we all know that it is not accurate. It's way lower than what our numbers are, but they tell us how to do it, um, when to do it. Um, and so we have some numbers. They're not, they're not representing the full um, need for sure, but it is um, a number that is, um, that we can use to inform, although it's not, we know it's way lower than what it actually should be. Um, but we do it the way that they tell us to do it. And so the last numbers that were recorded were in 2019. We did a count in 20 and we did a count in 21, but those haven't been verified because it kind of got in the way of the state um, releasing those numbers. But you can kind of see, they don't, they've been pretty static. You can kind of see where those numbers are. Um, and again, we kind of say in that synopsis, we know this is using HUD's definition and in their methodology, and it's just a tip of the iceberg and what the real need is. But I thought those numbers might be helpful. And then as you walk through the, the next page, I showed you a little bit of our COC system. This is a, a document that we try and keep up with um, and refresh to show when do we, when does the continuum of care for those who are homeless start and where does it end? Um, so we start at prevention. We know all the data shows if we can keep a family from becoming homeless, that it's much less expensive than if they enter the system, much more, tra more traumatic when they come into the system. And we know that the documentation and data suggests that um, we want to keep them from entering homelessness, if at all possible. And so we do have several organizations that work diligently to keep people from even experiencing homelessness. So that would be the prevention end, all the way to street level outreach that we see with access and the PATH team and others that are listed. Um, emergency shelters, transitional, all the way to subsidized, permanent supportive housing. And then we really want people to be stably housed. That's the goal. And so that's our goal for the continuum of care is we want good housing options for people 
to be able to move into. We don't stop at you're in subsidized housing. For some people, that may be where they want to be. But we want people to be as stably housed as they want to be. And we want a system that helps them to get there. So I just kind of wanted to share that information. Um, really here to champion solutions um, as we hear from providers about other things that we can do to support them, to help them. That's really what our coolishing is designed to do. So I'll certainly entertain any. Mindy, just questions. a question. On the yep. residency, when you get somebody that might be from a different county, um, do other counties, do you reach out to their homeless coalition and say, hey, we got somebody from Preble County. You know, they need some services, and then what? That's often what the providers are ending up doing, okay. um, is that they're trying to get them back to whatever their, um, their home is. And so it's very common that people are going down to Cincinnati or going to Dayton or going to Preble or Warren. Um, yeah, that's a very common ongoing kind of thing that we're, we're trying to do as providers. Not perfect, but that's what providers are, are striving to do. And the services are all tied countywide. So if you're on Medicaid, it's very complicated for you to be on Medicaid in Hamilton County and be trying to navigate Butler County system. So we try to you know, be sensitive to that. So. And then you mentioned when you came down, and it's okay if you want to take a pass and not answer the question, but you said, hey, there's maybe a few things I'm learning today that maybe we can step in and play a role and help. And would you mind sharing what those might be? What are those? What is my list? Yeah. Well, I hear, I've heard from Hamilton Police, and I'm hearing from Middletown Police, um, a, an ongoing kind of need for one number to call no matter what time of night or day, not just when services are active, but when I find someone at 2 a.m., I need that number to call. Um, Kathy has been you know, in the community working in this field for a long time, but she, her phone number, her cell number can't forever be our system, right? <laughs> so we need to, <laughs> we you, need to yeah. solve that issue. That's an ongoing kind of challenge. So one number to call, um, that, that's one thing I hear needing somebody to coordinate so that there's a, a person that can be be available to help connect all the resources resources are constantly changing and emerging and growing and we need to have make sure that there's a coordination of all of that 24 7. is that so whether something that's, that you have to have commissioner's approval or is that totally within your guys purview to run with it and make it happen or well, we are a private 501c3 nonprofit, okay. but we are volunteer driven. So that's, uh, we're all representing different pockets of providers at the coalition. So we collectively look at where can we problem solve. So yes, but there's not like ready made dollars to put that in place. But what, I, what we do try to do is figure out what is that next step then. Once we identify what some of the gaps are, how do we work together to fill that gap? So those are two things for sure that I heard um, today. I was really pleased to hear that the courts have all the agencies there. I know Hamilton's moved in having some um, an empowerment docket, but you have that three days a week, it sounds like, with agencies able to intervene on behalf of um, people that might be experiencing homelessness that come in. So. Other questions? Yeah, I have a follow-up. So you mentioned holes in the system. What would you consider the holes in the system to be? Well, the couple things I just mentioned, I think. Um, I think that we need just to keep on making sure that we are helping solve the root issues um, that bring people to homelessness. We all know there are addiction issues. We know mental health, and I think there's a lot of um, there's been a lot of momentum around those things, um, but there are people who refuse help. How do we help people who don't want to be helped is always a challenge. I don't know that there's, there's a solution for that, but I think we need to make sure we're keeping that top of mind. I think for people who are motivated to not be homeless anymore, we have a fantastic system in Butler County. Um, there are, you asked the question about uh, the percentage of success. I don't know what that percentage is, but it's really high. Um, Eighty-some percent of people that come through the doors of a shelter end up permanently housed somewhere. So I don't think that that's um, 
we don't see those successes because we see people who aren't helped or that are still on the streets as kind of the face of all things homeless. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people experiencing homelessness any given year who have one episode. And then our system does work because then they're not back into the system. But those aren't the people that are coming to mind, I think, for most of us. Um, so I think we need to, need to figure that out. How do we help people in the best way? Are there other things we can be doing to help people that are chronically homeless in ways that, um, you know, they have value? That's one of, our, one of our core values is recognizing that every person has value and they're worth helping. So how do we help them in ways that don't drain the system, but that are looking at how we give them a quality of life in our communities? I think that's something we definitely need to, to keep working on. Um, I don't think we need more emergency shelters. I think we need more housing. We need lots more affordable housing, not subsidized housing, but places for people to live. Um, so that's one of the, the big gaps that we talk about. So. How, how do you see that in relation to Middletown? And how, how do you see the numbers across the county in relation to Middletown? You know, and I look at this list of services, and I and I, Middletown, 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 Middletown. So that's an issue that we uniquely have to take into perspective. So, uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think Hamilton and Middletown are where people go because that's where the services are. So I hear what you're saying in that we are moving people from these other jurisdictions into these urban centers. I don't know that we're gonna get around that much, but I think we need to all recognize that doesn't necessarily mean they're Middletown folks or Hamilton folks, um, but those are where the services are. So I think that those two, I see them as very comparable in terms of the services being provided and probably the numbers of people that are um, from those communities. I do think the majority of people that are experiencing homelessness do come and originate from Middletown and Hamilton. But again, it's hard to get at that number because we're mm -hmm. talking about a transient population. Um, it's very difficult to get hard, fast data about where people are coming from, where they even last lived sometimes. Um, but I would say Hamilton and Middletown have the majority of services, and that's why they seem to have um, show up on the reports as having the largest numbers. Yeah, so I mean, it's hard to get to that. It's tough, yeah. but you know, you talk about the face of homelessness mm -hmm. and seeing it on the streets, mm -hmm. and there are places you see it, and there are places you don't. Mm -hmm. And as a community, mm -hmm. trying to put their best foot forward, that's really challenging for us. I hear you. So mm -hmm. you know, the expectation that maybe Trenton and maybe Monroe might step up and have services is something that you know is hard to say, but is you know. How, I, how many I, of these services are coming from those other smaller communities that can't not have any mm -hmm. impact on the homeless numbers? So that, you know, that yeah, just, you. that's the challenge. Yeah. And it's broader than that because a lot of your, your other service providers, your government providers, are in those urban cores. And so it's more complicated than just homeless services. It's not its own system. Mm -hmm. It's part, it takes advantage of the other systems that are around. And so... It's a bigger issue than just that, but having them at the table talking about how do they enter this conversation, help provide resources, I'd love to be part how of How do that. we get those people to the table to have this conversation with us as members of our broader community who are also as responsible as we are to help people? And maybe that's something that we can champion at the coalition and start to have those conversations. I would, I would I'll be love calling to you see about something that. like that happen. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Any you, other questions? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was on a call last night with probably 10 to a dozen other local elected folks, and I just kind of raised the question, and, and we were the most urban community on the call. And so I'm kind of curious from a Butler County perspective, the other communities that maybe aren't as urban as Middletown and Hamilton, to every person on that call said, we're not noticing any change. We don't even notice homeless is not an issue in our community. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious your perspective, are you getting any feedback from the other communities and any insight if they might be willing to participate in a countywide program that maybe you guys would play a key role in? And if not, I'm sure we can call our friends and 
if they might want to. I think it's following up on your, on your comment. I think it's worth a conversation to talk about that. Um, we've had many conversations with Oxford, who does recognize that it's an issue, um, and they are working in their little island um, to try and uh, tackle some things um, with with issues of homelessness there. Um, but I think it it is. It's, a, it's wrong to think that there's not the issue of homelessness in other parts of the county, although I do think that's largely the perspective, but it's because people find their way to these urban centers where their services are. And so I think it's just, uh, I, I think we probably need to have a conversation, I'll add that to my list, of other parts of the county to make sure there's a recognition this is a county-wide issue and that the urban cores are absorbing the majority of having to pay for resources and tackle these problems that we've heard about today that result from that. So I'll put that on my list. Thank you. Yeah. And speaking of seats at the table, I know we have a lot of people sitting at the table tonight wanting to come up, so. Yeah. Maybe if we can. Thank you for your time. Appreciate Thank you so much, Minnie. Appreciate it. Come to me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to next hand the conversation over to Access Counseling Services. I don't know whether, Amy, you want to start or? Okay. I would like to go ahead and introduce my teammates that are here with us, um, and then I would like to call them up with me if, if, if that's allowed during this conversation. Like, sounds um, this is Deanna Proctor, our CEO of Access Counseling Services. Kathy Becker, Kathy, her name in itself just stands alone, right? <laughs> so <laughs> Kathy is the Director of Court and Law Enforcement Services for Access Counseling Services. Debbie Wells is the director at the Community Engagement and Support Services Center um, downtown with the, uh, in our collaboration with The Gathering. Um, Deanna Shores is here. Deanna is the director of community case management. And Scott Miller is our director of community nursing with um, collaboration with Street Outreach in the Hope House. So as you can see, we've tried to bring all of our A game here so you can ask any questions and we can address any issues that, um, that we may be able to help with. Um, with Access, we, we started um, uh, probably, <laughs> Debbie would say a really long time ago, but um, probably about two years ago in a conversation about homelessness after we went into a partnership with the Hope House. Some of the statistics and things that you were seeing, um, I, I think, we would be remiss not to discuss the fact that we've been in a partnership with the Hope House now for um, a little bit over four years. We have uh, full-time therapists and full-time case managers, medical staff, psychiatrists, and nurses that work with the Hope House and in the Hope House every day. Um, Scott, that is his permanent home. He is there with our uh, local psychiatrist and working with everyone that comes through those doors. So when someone comes through the, walks through the Hope House doors, they are seen by an access counselor for um, an assessment of their um, drug and alcohol use and their mental health use to see if they're going to um, create some stability in the home or if they need to be hospitalized for some reason. And then at that time, we would make the clinical decision whether they needed residential drug and alcohol treatment and make that referral with a community partner in Genesis down um, in Hamilton. So at, um, at the Hope House, we do have great partnerships there. And then at the Women's Center, we also work there, and we also have the same psychiatrist nursing staff, um, a team of case managers and, um, and therapists that work there. The Community Engagement and Support Center came from a partner, because we had had such a successful partnership with the Hope House, the Community Engagement and Support Center came after um, a couple of years ago, our um, businesses downtown had asked, we're com not complaining, but um, airing the grievances about the downtown um, um, loitering that was happening during the business days. And I believe Amy may have been in on, on one of those conversations about the um, downtown loitering. And when we left that, that day, it was, we felt a personal responsibility as an agency to do something. Um, we had already started in conversation on the county level with the Butler County Mental Health and Addiction Recovery Services Board on what we could do as a service provider um, at, at a county level. 
And so the county at that time, I believe I came and spoke to council about this a little bit about that um, during that time frame. At a county level, we had, um, I believe, Deanna, correct me if I'm wrong, two or three instances where we traveled um, to other counties within the state to look at a crisis intervention unit, what that would look like, what the cost would look like. And there were many conversations that were had about specifically the things that you're referring to now. And at that level, the conversation was kind of tabled um, for fi financial reasons, for um, conversations between the commissioners and the board, and so that conversation remains, remained tabled. However, in Middletown, we continue to move forward with issues and concerns regarding the homelessness downtown. So uh, from Access's standpoint, we saw these people, many of them were our clients, people that we had, um, our outreach team had met on the street, or we were seeing going in and out of the homeless shelters, or just folks that would find their way into one of our six locations here in Middletown. So we went to the gathering, well, no, let me back up. The gathering came to us and said, we need help um, with our congregation. Um, the gathering has a very large congregation of um, folks that are in need of um, substance abuse or mental health treatment, and they came to us and asked if we would be willing to help, thus moving forward, creating a partnership that would allow us to be there to help serve their congregation, also allowing us to keep the doors open to um, have folks that were on, on the streets to come in for services that they would need. Thus, that not really creating a day shelter per se, but an engagement center, a place where folks could come in and they could engage for services. So through that partnership, that continued to grow for any, um, with the thought that we were having an engage, we would just have an engagement center. And then it grew to engagement and support services because we started connecting with other local agencies such as PATH, which was a, which is a, you know, street homeless outreach. Then they could come in, TLC, and they could come in. I know Victoria and the, and the QRT team has came in. And working with folks that were, um, that were needing that connection with their treatment providers, we would be the open door where they could come in, they could see the individuals that maybe they had been missing for a couple of weeks, and we could also provide a warm cup of coffee for someone. When it was five degrees outside, we could stay open a little bit later, so maybe the, um, the warm environment would entice them to want to come in and receive some kind of services. Through that and through continued growth and partnership with our local police department and our other partner agencies, we've been able to secure a, um, to be a part of securing a house grant. It's called House, which is a housing opportunities using supportive engagement um, through our Butler County Mental Health and Addiction Reco Recovery Services Board with a goal of housing 10% of the individuals that come in to our engagement and support center. We are also partnering with some local job placement um, facilities that have worked incredibly well with us. Um, Debbie has worked in the um, homeless realm here in Middletown for a number of years, so has created some great partnership opportunities for folks. As um, So when they come in, she knows exactly the people to contact and connect them with. Currently, our hours are from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., um, so we're we're not housing them. Um, they're coming in. When you they, say our hours, are you talking about the gathering Access counseling services Access. at the gather. It's the at engagement the center. Yes. Okay. So the gathering and probably this clarity needs to happen. And thank you for saying that, Mayor. Is um, the gathering church per se is only there from I believe 8 a.m. maybe 9 a.m. on Sunday morning until 1:30 on Sunday afternoon. The other six days out of the week, Access Counseling Services is running our engagement and support services center out of that location. So I do have some numbers that I think will be very eye-opening and helpful to you. Um, again, I'm, I'm just the voice here. These, the team that we have here, they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones that do all the work. They're the ones that need all the recognition for the numbers and the work that we've been able to do and make the substantial difference that we have in a very short period of time. We opened in November, and we opened in November because it was getting cold. That's the bottom line. <laughs> it was getting cold. There was a need. The need continued to grow. We had clients that were coming in up in our main office. We have six locations here in Middletown. We're only a Middletown-based agency. We're the largest fee-for-service provider in Butler County, but we're only a Middletown-based agency. So we had a lot of folks that were coming in off of the street um, from the woods, and they would come in, and they would just sit in our waiting room. 
they were just sitting there because it, it was cold or they needed someone to talk to. Everyone would appreciate just a smiling face and someone saying, how are you doing today? So when they came in and, and started voicing their concern of what was going to happen in the winter time, and I'm not going to be able to walk all the way from downtown up to Maine to get the services, we realized that if we didn't react, that there may, would be a good chance that people would go extensive periods of time without getting the medication that they need or without seeing the therapist that they needed. So when we came into the partnership with the gathering, what it did was provide opportunity and removed boundaries for folks that were needing mental health and drug and addiction services and or connecting them with housing. So the first week that we were there, we saw 72 unduplicated individuals. Last week, we saw 300. The first week that we were there, we provided 29 individuals with food. Last week, we provided 291 um, food. I believe those are lunches, correct, Debbie? Okay. Lunches for the day. Week one, we provided 21 showers. Week 15, week 15 we provided 58 showers. The highest number that we've had on any day was 69 individuals. The lowest was four, but that was the first day we were open and we didn't tell anyone. But they still found their way there. We're averaging between 50 to 60 people a day currently. Again, 69 unduplicated individuals. Ten individuals have, um, have been connected with services outside of the city of Middletown. 37 individuals have applied for um, food stamps. 12 individuals have applied for Social Security. Four individuals have been reconnected with, with VA services. And six individuals have been housed with their own funds. How are they getting to you? I'm sorry? How are they getting to you? Just They're walking. walking. Yep, they're walking. There are some of our local partners that are um, bringing people that I know Victoria has worked with folks that will say, I need to see Dr. Edelman, I need to see Dr. So-and-so, and those are all our psychiatrists that we work with, and they'll bring folks down to the engagement center and say, can you connect them with their access counselor, can you connect them with whatever services, and, um, and it's just, it's a one-stop shop for them to come and to make sure that they're able to connect with our folks. Debbie is uh, one of the clinician that works down there, and a lot of the folks that come in are her individual clients. Questions? Do you have any questions for me regarding what we do, what we... When you see success, what's, is there any one thing or two or three things where it's like these are the things that trigger success? So what triggers success is wraparound services. So success cannot be a one-man show. When it comes to folks that have been homeless by choice for many times decades, coming in, uh, me coming in straight off of the street, not knowing them from Adam, trying to engage them in services is not going to work. It takes repetition, relationship, um, knowledge of the mental health and addiction services world, and connectivity. Relation, Middletown's about relationship. Um, it, it would be nearly impossible for anyone to be ex successful in Middletown if they did not have established relationships or did not know how to firmly establish those relationships with the individual client. So when we've seen, um, I had an email and I even thought about reading it, but I thought it might be a little bit pompous to do so. But we have, um, we have an email from one of the um, local providers in, in Hamilton who spoke about a client that he had been working with for years and trying to get um, him involved with services. But Scott and the Hope House team, when he came into Hope House in October, he had been without a job. He had been homeless for years and unable to take his medication. But when he left the Hope House February 5th, he had a job an apartment, had reconnected with his family, and was on his medication. So to answer the, the question, it is about relationship and wraparound services. We can't, which I think is a great, this is a great representation of why this issue is so important, because it's important to all of us. That's why we're here. You know, if any one of us could do this alone, it would, there would only be one person sitting here. But when Susan and, and I spoke, it was, hey, let's put the SOS out to everyone within the city that has been able to help with this or that we've moved forward with. And each one of us have a key component, Kathy in the courts, Debbie at the Engagement Center, Scott at Hope House, Victoria with the QRT, and Deanna with the case managers, and coming in and saying, hey, it takes all of us to make this work. And whatever we do moving forward, I think it's going to be clearly imperative that 
all of the partners at the table and all of them have um, have a voice in how we're going to address this moving forward because it, access counseling isn't for every homeless client. It, we're just not. And the QRT isn't for every homeless client. They're just not. But that's okay because when we work together, we can find something that can work for everyone. The difference in success and not is seeing people for people and not just seeing people as a number. When someone comes to you and they're telling you that I've been homeless for five years because I'm living in a world of addiction, or I've been homeless for five years because I can't seem to get on the right mental health medication, and I really don't like my therapist, and nobody can stand me whenever I go off on my meds, to have a person that looks at you and says, you know what, I may not be that person, but I'm willing to help you find that person, is a difference between night and day for success. Because when we step out of our silo and start working together and realizing that these people are just as much residents of Middletown as those taxpayers, and if we want to be successful as a city, we're going to walk with them in the journey so they can become successful taxpayers, when we get to that point, then that's when this whole thing will be worth every moment that we've been here speaking. Well said. <laughs> Any other questions I can ask? Nobody wants to follow answer. that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's tough to Thank hear the you. numbers. It's tough so very to hear much. the numbers too. Because like as a business owner, as someone who owns a business downtown, I hear the number 300 and I'm like, oh my goodness, there are 300 people down there. And, I, and I'm sorry I, to clarify, but didn't you say it was 70? Was it under page? Well, in any one day, you said the maximum number you, of people you've got in there is like cool. 65 or 70. Yeah, we have, we have 69 people is our highest per day, yes. Yeah. But, you know, over the course yeah. of that period of time, yeah. it's hard not to hear the numbers and compare that with how many people, as a business owner, I see in that particular neighborhood. I mean, I'm right next door to you on Central Avenue at right. Bandana's also. So I'm seeing it in both locations, mm -hmm. the people coming and going from the locations. So I, just from the other side, it is it is tough to ignore the numbers when when you're actually seeing them outside of your business. Oh, absolutely. Oh, so. absolutely. Um, again, remember, we came into this, we didn't have a dog in the fight <laughs> when all of this first started, but we came into it because there was, I, I think Deanna Shores and I were at um, Triple Moon having coffee one day, and the former chief and Heather came over and said, we need to talk. There's, there's an issue. And so we started in that, that conversation um, moving forward. So absolutely, from the business end of it, hear it, um, you know, <laughs> We're a business too. We don't not make any money, but we're 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 on the business end of it too. So I uh, understand completely. Understand that part. The frustrating part that we also have to keep in mind as and as, as a city is this is only going to get worse, and it's only going to get worse because of COVID. It may only get worse for a short period of time, but we do have to prepare for this. Um, there's no housing right now, right? There's no housing because no one can be evicted. And no one can be evicted. So all of the people that are in the Hope House, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong. So our 25 men that we have in the Hope House aren't budging because they can't. There's nowhere for them to go because the, our folks aren't being evicted from housing. So these folks aren't being evicted. These folks aren't budging from the homeless shelter. So the people we would normally take off the street and be placing in the shelter now can't go into the shelter because there's no room. There's no room in the inn here. So they're stuck on the street, and the homelessness on the street homelessness continues to grow, and yet there's no movement at a top level. When people are allowed to be evicted again, you're going to have massive amounts of families and individuals that are being evicted from their homes, and very few people that are going to be able to move into those facilities because they haven't had the support services of like a homeless shelter and or a, a very large engagement team during COVID. What happens to the people who are getting evicted from their houses? They'll, they will be another statistic out on, yes. And it, and then it just, and it continues to grow. Clarification. The yes, sir. People you served last week, I guess I understood that as unique individuals, but now I'm questioning that because of this back and forth. 69 unique individuals. 69 unique, okay. Yes, 69. In or in the? In a, in a day. In a day. And so in a week, in a week, it just depends upon the day. Debbie, you might want to stand. You could speak to 
that more clearly. We had 69 individuals was the highest in one day, but then there, there could be like 40 in one day, 50 one day, 35 the next day, and then, at, but at the end of the week, we'll have served over 300 people. But those could be re repeat, obviously. Yes, yes, it could be, yes. 69 unduplicated individuals, yes. But when we talk about, like, we have to, we, we, well, we don't have to, we feed lunch, and we don't feed lunch, we provide if there's like a, um, whatever we have available. If it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. The Dream Center will provide food majority of the time for our folks. Um, and you've been doing this for, since November? Yes, since November. Yes. And it, again, November because it started getting cold. And I'll tell you that I've been, so um, I've been a social worker for 21 years. And I've never worked harder than I had the year that Deanna laughs that she tried to kill me. But it was the, the week of the polar vortex. I think I met with Chief Burke. I met with Debbie. I've met with Kathy. I met with RTA, with Serve City, with Hamilton, <laughs> with Hamilton officers, anyone um, begging for help. Because we knew that we had at least 25 individuals that were going to be out in a homeless camp and it was going to be negative 10 with, with no barriers to help protect them. And um, that's why I love the city and that's why we've looked at, worked in the city for so long is because our resources were able to come together to help those individuals and to provide that opportunity. But those are things that we want to try to, um, to prohibit if at all possible. Just, and, and I realize that we can't force people into shelter. You just can't. Homelessness is not a crime. Um, it's not an arrestable offense. Some people can be choose to be homeless, but we want to provide opportunity, opportunity for our Middletonians that are here that are homeless, opportunity for them to come in, receive services, maybe get a hot cup of coffee, and have the opportunity to engage and opportunity to in receive um, housing and employment. If you had the ability to give a quick elevator pitch to someone who is interested in opening a business up next to the gathering, Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? Can you give me give me a type of business? Mm -hmm. um, anybody got any ideas? You know what I'm trying to get at here. Clothing shop. Sure. How about a boutique clothing shop? Awesome. You have someone who might know. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So the best thing about opening a boutique clothing shop next to the engage arms the engagement center would be that we are going to be the place where all of your folks are going to go. You're not going to have to worry about the loitering because they're going to be here with us. You're not going to have to worry about um, folks t trying to take your parking spots because they won't be driving in. You're not going to have to worry about um, folks being fearful of coming in because our folks take ownership in the engagement center. They take pride in where they're at. And they know that if we're not there, they have nowhere else to go. So. Debbie is their biggest advocate, and they will protect her like there is no tomorrow. So if you can come in and you can put a clothing shop right next to us, what we can guarantee for you is that you're going to have people that are going to respect your business like they respect ours. Thank you. Because you know that's what always the balance, right? Absolutely. And we appreciate everything you guys are doing, and so we're tasked with both sides of it. And Understood. Really grateful. That's Understood. Good. And by the way, if you want to write some marketing pieces for some of our downtown businesses. I'm sure they'll be reaching out to you. So. <laughs> I just have one, one more thought that keeps cycling for me is, would you define sec, uh, success as a, a decrease in the number of people making that cycle coming through, or, or does, that, does that number of people <clears throat> cycling through the system continue to grow and continue to grow? And is there any way to control or try to control the growth of the circle. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. because that's that's really I think the concern, a concern for us right. is that that you know the circle starts here and it's good and it's a good circle and then the circle gets a little bigger and we call it success and then the circle gets a little bit bigger and we call that success. So, you know, is is reducing the circle success also? And how do we do that? Absolutely. Reducing the circle is success if that's the data that you're looking for. So what, whatever, me, whatever tools you're using to measure success, then that's what we're going to focus on. What the house and engagement grant that we have through the Butler County Mental Health and Addiction Recovery Services Board, I believe says 10% of the individuals that we see that come in, that we will house them. 
So not only are you looking for jobs for some of those individuals, but we're looking for housing for them. So that's our target for this year, that we would decrease that number by 10%. So if we could continue to do that, if you could continue to set that goal as a house of to decrease the number of homeless individuals that come in that do not have their own residence, if we could decrease that by 10 percent, then that would be an obtainable um, number that we would that we would work towards. So if we had 300 people, it would be 30 people at the end of the year would be housed. That may not seem like a lot. But it, but it really is when you're talking about, you know, taxes and property taxes, income taxes being um, taken off of those individuals. Sure. I just, I had yeah. just had to address well, it while we were talking about it because I feel like that's something that I think is important to a lot of people. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we're in therapy. We always have the individual, what's your service plan? What are your goals? What are you working towards? So for us with the strategic planning um, of the engagement center goals that we have um, as an agency is that we would have 10% of the individuals that walked in the door would receive um, housing. 10% of the individuals that walked in the door, an additional 10% would receive um, services of some kind. And that that would make it sustainable to where we could continue to do that and reevaluate the goals on a year to year basis. I appreciate all the work that you yeah. do. Thank you. I know. Okay. Thank you. It's, it's something that goes thankless a lot of times. So thank you. They do great work. Thank you. We are going to move on to our last guest speaker of the day. Victoria Hensley is here from One City for Recovery. Uh, Victoria has some experience with our heroin response, our quick response team, um, and we approached them about the pilot program to expand those services to provide that one phone number that the police can call and uh, to provide some accountability and um, working for the city to be able to get some of those numbers and the data that we were looking for um, and be able to get some of the success that we've experienced with our QRT team um, in this arena as well. So I'm going to hand it over to Victoria. We also have the best mask of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm leaving for Miami on Monday, so I cannot wait. Yeah. Um, I want to be very respectful of everybody's time because it is like 5.30. Um, this is an overview. Um, is what you might want to get a little bit closer to the microphone, only because I, I can't hear it picking you up. So I can hear you, but probably other people might not. Yeah, um, just an overview of uh, One City and the Hope Line. My experiences with um, the Middletown homelessness and how we could proceed the pilot. <coughs> Uh, we've been uh, established since 2014. Um, we've been here locally in Middletown since 2016 with the quick response team. Um, it started with the heroin response team. So what that is is we go out weekly with police and fire um, and myself. It started originally with Lindsay um, in 2016. I joined the team in October um, 2017 and have been the full-time care coordinator here in Middletown. Um, you can go to the next slide. <clears throat> That's just us um, doing some community outreach here in Middletown. Um, we don't just go out on Tuesdays. That's our formal day to go out. Um, but we do go out and um, try to reach individuals throughout the week. We also have um, social media accounts that we reach people because not everybody has, you know, Wi-Fi at home. Most of our individuals are homeless but not street homeless. So there is that difference there. Um, most of our folks are pretty much staying at someone's house, overdosing, you know, just kind of out there, using a parent's address, um, family member's address. I think I was seen earlier with the courts. Um, a lot of times, like I got a call the other day from a police officer, and she said, hey, so-and-so wants you to follow up with him. Here's his address and phone number. Well, he gave the officer the wrong phone number to follow up with, and the address that he uses is not current. He just gives that address. So, you know, the court numbers are kind of strange sometimes because they just give an address. Um, One City for Recovery also opened the first male recovery house in Warren County, and we also partner with the Warren County Drug Court. Uh, we are highly motivated. We are uh, started out with Lindsay herself in 2014 and 15, and we are up to nine care coordinators. We cover um, Montgomery County, Warren, and Clinton, Butler, uh, and Middletown. <clears throat> Oh, it does say that um, we've interacted with over 4,000 individuals to date, including 1,100 residents of Middletown, um, with over 700 referrals from Middletown law enforcement, fire, jail, and also the um, just referrals from other agencies. Also, we'll get treatment centers that will call us, um, like the Genesis program, um, access. They'll say, hey, we've got this individual, and 
you know, they need a higher level of care or they need transportation to a treatment center. And with us not being a treatment center or providing services, we can do that um, at no cost to anyone because we do not bill for services. Um, we partner with 70 different agencies um, and give referrals to 70 different agencies. So if someone is here in Middletown, my goal is to remove them <laughs> um, because you can't heal where you're broken. So I usually take an individual to either Dayton or Cincinnati for inpatient treatment um, and then refer them to sober living or transitional living once they complete that program. Um, that's where we find the most success. We can go to the next one. This is a personal story that um, this individual, uh, with her permission, <laughs> shared her story um, October, no, I'm sorry, January the 2nd of 2020. I received a call from Officer Birch, and he had a female that was literally freezing. It was 20 degrees out that day, um, and she had warrants, and she said, I want to go to jail because I'm freezing. And he said, I'm not doing that. I'm going to call someone to get you some help. She was... Um, an active addiction and she was also practically 20 weeks pregnant. Um, I went down there immediately, picked her up, took her to Miami Valley Hospital to the Promise to Hope program where she completed a medical detox which was approximately about three to five days. And in the meantime, I'm coordinating with First Step Home in Cincinnati um, which is up to a 12 month program to get her down there once she was detoxed and discharged from Miami Valley Hospital, I did. Brandy currently has 13 months of sobriety she has her child in her custody. <laughs> she didn't lose that child to the state. She has her own apartment. And to top it off, she is now paying Steve <laughs> office. <laughs> Let's clarify. Let's not start those rumors. And the judge. <laughs> She's paying her fines to the city of Middletown, y'all. <laughs> like, that's awesome. That's the goal here. Um, we want everybody in this room wants people to return to some sort of normalcy. Um, because these are daughters, brothers, sisters. I mean, these are someone's children, someone's parents, and that's the whole goal is just to help people. Um, and we have to work together to get this end result. So the pilot program, build and expand upon um, successful Hope Line approach. Um, the Hope Line approach, I'm just going to be real honest with you, is just to hound people. Um, we probably should have, like, restraining orders against myself and Lindsay <laughs> because we are constantly like, hey, are you ready? Hey, I just want to check up on you. Um, is there anything I can help you with today? Um, can I get you to access to go, you know, to see your appoint your get your appointment? Um, call Scott and say, hey, Scott, you got a bed over there at the Hope House because I really need this person to go. Um, advocating for someone to get help. That's just what we do. Um, providing useful resources. Um, you know, working with the police, uh, the judge is wonderful. If someone is in jail when they violated, you know, they've been had so many summons to court and they get arrested, um, the, the courts will work with us. Probation and the judge will hold an individual until we have an open bed somewhere that we can get them placed into treatment. Um, you know, it's the funding is for wraparound services um, and to execute and collect and um, analyze the data. So, that's pretty much it. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Um, very good. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions about looking at a county-based solution, and I wish that was as quick of, hey, let's just call some people and we'll get a county-based solution. It has not proven that easy. Um, but we continue to have some of those conversations, but nothing is really um, solidified into action. Um, one of my hopes, I think, by starting these type of programs is that we are collecting data, um, working with providers, and providing a proof of concept to then work to some of, work through Mindy and her organization and work to some of our partners and say, hey, look, this is what we could do if we work together and provide funding together and really some of the results that we can get um, and being able to help pursue that while we're working through this solution. Um, but the, we have the, so far the outreaches we've made to the county partners have been um, not able to be solidified into action at this point. Are we reaching out to County or are we reaching out to other local jurisdictions? It has largely been the county to look for the, them to give that leadership at role in pursuing other options for the county. 
I know one of you were supposed to have time, but it is 5.44. I think we've had a great discussion, um, but I wanted to give some time to see what other questions council had or if there are other items that people would like to um, bring to the table. I think Kathy is very excited to say something. Kathy, do you mind actually coming up and going to the microphone because I don't think Ms. Vittori can hear you, which means it's I'm yeah. trying. <laughs> yeah, we need you up on okay. on the stage. And it's B I R it's B I R K. <laughs> Thank you, sorry, I appreciate I'm it. Such a shy person. Don't mind. Yeah. Um, I I really just wanted to get up to do some praise because um, I've done the mental health um, been involved with the mental health system for 41 years, 30 of which have been involved with the police department. And Middletown was my first um, jurisdiction I rode with ever in my career. So if anybody wants to blame how I behave, it would be. <laughs> but I just want to praise that I am on call for them 24 seven. And it's not just for homeless, but for mental health concerns. And they've called on some really good calls that we ended up, the person didn't get arrested or didn't go to the hospital because of the officers working collaboratively. Um, but I also wanna say they're very protective of my time. So they're not calling like at two in the morning every day of the week. They get very protective and when they call, they're calling for a good reason because they're very good and trained in de-escalation and working with people and following up. So I wanna start with there. Thank you, Chief. The other I want to credit is the court. So I've got to say that we are working on a grant um, from the Mental Health and Addiction Board that puts a full-time person and then two days a week meet in Middletown Court. Um, and that's been going on for two and a half years. 1,000 people have been referred from Middletown Court to us to look at services and 75%, and I just did the stats yesterday from Mental Health and Addiction Board, 75% of the people have engaged in services. So I think that says a lot about the whole concept of police contact to the court's attitude towards people and how that whole system has gelled together. And this has all been worked with no cost to the city of Middletown, because again, we believe in the city of Middletown this is who we're supposed to be serving. Um, and if you guys want to approach the countywide, one of the things I like to do is hound the county about why is Middletown not getting something because they're part of the county. And I will gladly step in and see what we could do to help gel a countywide group. Because I could tell you my most police calls right now are coming from Westchester and it's homeless and mental health. So they've seen a big influx of people homeless in Westchester and a lot of it is people kicking their children out who have mental health and they don't know how to deal with them. Um, there's also other jurisdictions dumping people in Westchester, people getting evicted in Westchester. So it's all over the county and we feel our goal is to work with the person in the jurisdiction they're from because if nothing hurts self-esteem, it's to think your own jurisdiction doesn't want you and they're trying to kick you out. So again, any help I could be, I just wanted to say, I think the world of Middletown, but I wanted to praise, because sometimes this is a forgotten group, and let you know any help I could be, I'm there for you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I, I'll speak for all of these guys, because I know um, what a wonderful resource Kathy has been for the community and being available to people. Um, but I also think there was something important to said that Kathy's phone number can't be the entire system. And wanting to make sure we have some resources on board to help everyone get services that they need and be able to have that contact and that's part of the reason why we're looking and we looked at this proposal is to put more boots on the ground that are accountable to the city and that work with everyone as um, agencies to help solve some of these problems and get us better information so that we can in turn know how we can fi help fix some of these issues as a city um, but it, certainly not to denigrate any of the work anyone in this room is doing because I think we have top-notch service providers that are all doing the best they can and working together as much as they can. And, and that's one of the things I've been very proud to hear as I go through some of this information. Um, just a couple thoughts for my colleagues and for Ms. Cohen. But first, this was incredible. This was better than the last one. This opened my eyes to a lot more things. So thank you, everybody, for coming. It was, I think it was, for me, it was worth your time, even though it was your time. Um, 
since we can talk about this here, since this is probably proposed to be on our agenda Tuesday, I just wanted to give you guys a preview of what I'm thinking. Um, I think the program would be tremendously beneficial. What the struggle I've been having for the last couple weeks is Middletown program. You know, we had Steve and the chief stand up here and say, Middletown's got all the services. That's why everybody comes. And Amy's not going to like this. Um, I, I really wish, you know, after, after having heard from Mindy, and they might have some interest in this, maybe we give it a few weeks. I got five people here that I have personal relationships with that are council members or township trustees in other parts of the county. Let's call them and say, hey, guys, would you throw a couple thousand dollars at a program for the county to run? Or not, not even the county, the homeless coalition. Maybe it's the same program with the same groups. And I'd like to try that first before we create another Middletown program. Let's make it a county program that Middletown and the other communities participate in. That's where my head is right now. I have heard from multiple people and, and across the board that Middletown does not get the county resources that it deserves and that we are disproportionately shouldering this particular topic. And I appreciate that Tal is looking at it from a bigger perspective because I do think that's really important. I also don't live this on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't know your world and I have, I'm have, i having difficulty capturing um, the synergy. I don't quite understand who's nonprofit, who's for-profit. And by the way, I don't care if someone's for-profit in this world because they're, they're still helping in any way. So that's not, I'm not knocking any for-profit entities. I just don't understand how everyone works together. Like, is one city a competitor to access to Butler County? I don't, I guess I don't get that piece. And so for me, it's very difficult right now. I'm just trying to grasp, like, are you all behind doing this together? Are you like, ooh, we kind of would like a contract with the city? Are you, do, do you know what I'm getting at? And, and I could ask you all individually outside of this meeting, but we're here. So I don't, <laughs> Um, if anyone's able to kind of shed light on that, I would appreciate it. Well, <laughs> so, um, do you mind grabbing a microphone? I'm sorry to make it. If, can you pass that back? Maybe she can. I'll hold it. You just hold it, Steve. Thank sure. you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Looks good. <laughs> um, I don't think that anyone that we're, I mean, from access standpoint, we're not against anyone getting any kind of contract that the city feet, the city fills is what is best for the city. Um, we want to make sure that whomever does it is clinically sound, licensed individuals that can make those decisions on a drug and alcohol and mental health level and can make solid recommendations to the police, to the courts, and to other agencies. That's what we're looking for. That's what, and we want to partner with whomever that is. Whomever it is that can do it, if, if it's one city, if it's, if it's anybody else. It, it truly doesn't matter for us. It's about what is going to be best for those clients and what is going to be best for the people that are in um, what we would call our outreach with our outreach team. So if that means that we're going to work together and I just beg the city not to make this one person. Um, if, if you put all it's a setup for failure. If you say, hey, Victoria, I want you to be the one person for the entire county or for all of Middletown and do it all by yourself. Like it's, there's going to have to have a network of people that support that individual and that regardless of where that is. And it also asks that the city make this sustainable, that it's not a one-stop shop where it's, we're going to throw $50,000 at you and it's going to go away. And then, you know, what happens next year? Well, good luck trying to find a job. I ask that we're asking that the city do something that's sustainable. So we're not band-aiding a situation. We're creating a part of a bigger plan. So whatever that is, um, that it is part of a sustainable plan that can further address the homeless issue, whether we take this to a county level and it continues to grow at a county level, or if this is a pilot program that we keep in the city. Thank you. That's helpful. And, and from what I understand then, what, whoever would be this central, um, thank you, Steve, this point of contact, not a single person, but entity, can then refer to all these different organizations and send people to all of you in whatever capacity makes sense. Is that correct? If, yes, I think it is correct. And I also think, you know, this is not a matter of distinguishing one person to be the lead for the entire city of Middletown. This is just the city partnering with one agency to bring some more effort to the table. Uh, 
access can't handle everybody. The engagement center can't handle everybody. So the city being able to provide another resource. This is not one resource is the lead or on top of the other one, or there's no hierarchy here. This is just the city providing an additional resource that's accountable to the city to help us um, have those phone calls and be able to um, be, hold, have the accountability to the city for reporting and making sure that we're getting information and providing another person in the field. It's not a hierarchy of anyone. It's we expect and hope that everyone's going to be willing to work together. So I just want to make sure that was clear. This is not setting the central contact for homelessness in the entire city. It's just providing extra support, particularly the focus that our police would have one number to call and also to be able to have some reporting that is obligated to come directly to us. Deanna, did you have a comment you wanted to add to the conversation? Yes. Thank you. And if that didn't end up on the um, recording so people could hear, she said, we need the churches at the table as well. There's a portal system coming down the pike, and that, that should help us communicate better as resources. Yeah. That, okay, so there's a portal for churches coming. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I would just like to say, for me, I feel the same as I think most of us on council to the degree that we know Middletown has bared the brunt of a lot of these services. And, you know, for whatever people might think that makes us a magnet or not, we wouldn't want to increase that. Um, and I think a countywide solution would be terrific, but I think it'll take time. I mean, I think, I, don't, I can't imagine anything happening in a matter of weeks. And so in my mind, if we have this CARES Act funding, so it's not our dollars, and we can do this program now and learn from it, maybe we do that simultaneously to talking to Butler County so that then we can see what works, use some data, have some outcomes, and together then embark on a program. But it's CARES Act funding, it's available now, the issue is critical now with COVID. I mean, it warmed up today, great, but we still have some winter time ahead of us. And I just think that if we start it now, we learn, we get data, that compels Butler County and our partners in the area to get on board, I think more than if we keep waiting. And that's my opinion. For me, it's a little bit less about compiling the data because it seems like we've got a lot of data. It seems like what we're really trying to do is connect those resources and things like the hub and creating uh, relationships with the county and all of those efforts are what we're really focusing on in trying to get people off of the streets and into care. So uh, it's still a tough call and I think that having the CARES Act funding definitely helps, um, but also seeing success in whatever way we're gonna measure that when we talk about this after the trial period is, is really the only way to see if it is, I guess, accomplishing the goals that it has set. So 
setting those goals, accomplishing those goals, and looking at that as a measure as opposed to necessarily focusing on data gathering. But Well, that's what I meant by data. If we set yeah. outcomes and we see how they're achieved, then that's data we can use for a future program. I have a slight concern about uh, just a hesitation in collecting data in Middletown without there being data being collected elsewhere, only because I fear that now we have numbers and now people are saying, oh, look at the numbers in Middletown. And no one else has the numbers, but we have them and we've paid for them and we've paid for them to be accurate. And now people are like, well, shoot, look at Middletown, yikes. Uh, so to that extent, without a parallel effort occurring at a county level, I don't, I just. I, Where are your measurables in comparison to other communities and the issues that they are or are not dealing with? And that's the struggle I think that we've always had in Middletown is that we've got all the programs, we've got all the resources. If you, if you build it, if you create it, they'll come and, and, what, and what outcome does that provide and what situation does that put us in in the long run? I mean, these are not new conversations. I feel like we've been talking about that and its relationship to this conversation the whole time. So I think that's really, that's really the struggle is how do we get other people to share in that responsibility with us? Well, and it is or are we just always going to be the ones that hold all the responsibility? It's a transient topic too. We've all, we've all said it, right? They're not, they're, everybody's flowing from one community to the next and trying to attack it is only one city is also, I mean, it's not even intelligent. In the, and, I, and I know you guys aren't doing that. You are working with other people. But as a city, I feel like we, it's our responsibility to do that as well. Well, like I said, I'll be calling some people around the county. If anybody would like to join me, whether they're sitting up here or sitting out there, I would welcome your help. I would love to see a second council member on a call. I have one, um, if you could indulge. The, I, I, I think we just need to maybe focus in on the unsheltered homeless. That, that seems to be the term that is, is best to describe those who are on, who are on the streets. Um, you know, I, I, and I think that's a concern to residences, residents and business owners. And if we can get a handle on that. Um, another takeaway from today, I think we need to engage, um, for instance, AK, uh, steel uh, Cleveland Cliffs about the research facility if that has turned into a um, a magnet for uh, crime I think we need to talk to them about either repurposing that or demolishing it I think they've closed that oh has no I think they're still holding on oh, I was told the city has tried communicating with them is that accurate do you know the status of that uh, there have been um, some initial conversations there is a concern about um, the environmental a um, aspect and doing some due diligence before acquiring that property. I meant um, specifically about the issue that the chief was talking about, that there are people trespassing on the property. I don't know if we've had conversations with them about that. I believe they've mentioned it, but I don't know if there's any serious conversations. I was speaking to Moon's point about acquiring. Okay whether it's been sold yeah no i'm not even suggesting acquisition by the city i'm just saying we, we need to sure. we need we need to make that i think a front burner mm -hmm. we clearly aren't great at uh keeping trespassers off our own property right now either well so. and, and right thank you mayor my, my second point then if we have all of these partners agencies that that we could um get together on a wednesday afternoon and clear out these encampments you know, one by one, week by week or day by day, I, I think, you know, I think that would be a good service to these individuals because it's not fair for us to say, ah, they're just living in the woods. Let them enjoy that. No, that, I mean, uh, I, I think we serve them better when we say this is not appropriate place for you to be. A, this is city property. B, it's, it's, it's causing a... Um, I think the perception would be, I mean, if somebody's living in Smith Park, 
I don't know if a family with her kids wants to be running or playing or, 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 or whatever in Smith Park uh, w when that behavior is going on. So I think maybe it's just a matter of corralling all these resources together on, on given days and really giving them the choice. You know, you can go here to get help. You can go here to get a bed. You can go, but you can't stay here. This is, these encampments are not going to happen on city property. And they won't happen on private property either. Um, so I, I think that would be the takeaway that I'm, that I'm, think, I'm thinking is very possible in the very near future. Um, and one thing, find my final point uh, that I didn't hear today was the engagement of business owners uh, like Miss Ninny. How do we reach out to them to say, either re report these issues if you're having homeless individuals that are making it hard for you to do business here, what is the best response? Um, for you and your employees? Uh, how, how do you engage with the police officer, with the police department uh, to get better data, um, you know, again, to, to make sure that, that these indivi individuals are making it hard to do business in Middletown. So that's, um, those are my takeaways. Thank you. One thing, if I may, because I think this is a good distinction, is this idea of, you know, we want to take people out and say we're not going to do the homeless camps and get someone out there. I can call services as much as possible and they try and help and, and they'll do everything they can do. I can't force anybody to go out and direct their services to exactly where we want them to be done. So some of the benefit to having somebody actually directly accountable to the city is that we have more time dedicated to be able to direct that work. And so I, I think that would help a little bit in getting some of those issues addressed that you bring up because I agree with you that they need to be addressed. Um, and, and But I just also know that I'm not responsible for access and funding and their ability. So sure. while they do the best they can to accommodate us and they do wonderful things, as long as our other agencies, someone that's directly accountable to the city, I can control that a little bit better. And that's fine. If Ms. Hensley is, the, is quarterbacking that, that, that would be that would be fine. Yeah. No, I, I understand our limitations. We can't. Yeah. We can't, but but it sounds like there that there are, are multiple agencies, organizations that would be willing to help. Absolutely. Whether that's the churches, Hope House. You know whether Absolutely. present here today or not, um, and then public works comes Absolutely. next day and demolishes the uh, the uh, honeysuckle or woods or whatever you know whatever it is. Yes. So that Which it prevents we've done the for a few camps and things, and we'll we'll need to keep continuing. Absolutely. I think that really speaks to the functionality of what their role would be for the city, because you make a great point that we can't direct private entities or other you know, other agencies to pinpoint a certain location that we deem a problem. Um, so I think uh, just to sort of piggyback on that, I, th I felt like that made a lot of sense to me. Um, I also wanted to talk today a little bit about the court has talked about, and Judge, you've talked about, um, like work programs and those sort of things, deterrence to jailing, and I would love to see more of that involved in this approach to handling um, some of the people who are repeat offenders and, and that sort of thing. Because I, I know we've talked about it several times. I, I'd really like to see something like that be a part of the solution. You know, I heard Joe uh, mention tennis tuckle and that immediately popped in my head. Yeah, I could get the, get the, the <laughs> community uh, service out there and, and uh, taking care of those kind of issues. Of course, with COVID, uh, that just totally stalled our, our Service program, but okay. uh, we have done that in the past, yeah. Yeah. especially so. back with um, uh, the Mormons and such uh, downtown. We did a downtown Middletown cleanup at one point a uh, long time ago, <laughs> but it is something that we've done in the past. We've, we've had it gone. We've met with Susan a couple times. We've had a few uh, conversations about this. Okay. COVID did just totally stall it out. Yeah. But Thank you. I wanted to make one more comment about timeliness. Um, the homeless issue to someone who's out on the street is only is always going to be an emergency matter, right? Um, but I also want to keep us from looking at the solution as though it is one of an emergency because this is very strategic 
And the better we plan and make our decisions in a strategic, well thought out manner, the better the solution I believe will be. So I really don't want us to say, we have to get this city solution in place because it'll take only a few weeks and we can do it. Um, when maybe the better solution is to take a few months, come up with the county solution, whatever it might be. And maybe it's still the city solution, but really we need to make sure that we're not rushing because our, I think the right solution is more important than just coming up with a solution. So that's my feeling on, on how quickly, I mean, I wanna get something as quickly as we can. I never wanna drag our feet for sure, um, but I don't wanna do it at the cost of the quality of what we're doing. But then what's the guidance? Because we've asked the city two years ago to come up with a plan. Obviously that got stalled for various reasons, but now staff has worked together with all these partners to put a plan forward to us. So if we don't want this plan, what are we telling them we want that we would approve? What I would ask is that we have to take more personal ownership and not just expect staff to take the ball. I would ask Susan and, and Jim and whoever else is involved to reach out to the County Homeless Coalition. It sounds like they're interested in playing a big role in this. See what role that might be. And if we can have conversations with our peers, maybe we can develop some, uh, I, we keep saying county, but I'm really just thinking it's multi-jurisdictional. It's not about the county, although they may play a role. It's about Hamilton, it's about Westchester, it's about Fairfield, it's about Oxford, it's about maybe Monroe. You all put a little bit of money in and maybe we get to the same place. And then it's a Butler County solution and not something unique to us. Um, and maybe it doesn't work, but I'd like to at least try it. Well, and, and even if we were to say, hey, we have this idea of a pilot program in Middletown, we would like um, your agreement that you're gonna, that you do a similar program in your city, let's do it all at once, try it, and we can all communicate during that time period as well, so that it, it is bigger than just here, because the pilot program isn't something that's like, I mean, we know there's gonna be success with that concept, right? It's not like, oh, we're gonna try it and it could fall on its face. I mean, I think the concept is there, we understand it, um, but to get more people involved and more buy-in outside of Middletown, is, it's critical. So we're not talking about the plan then, because before it was, let's not just rush to put some plan in place. So we're okay with the plan, we just don't wanna do it by ourselves. Well, the plan right now is only Middletown. But the action, what the plan is. So whoever does it, let's say it's us or the county, we're okay with the plan but we don't want to be the only ones doing the plan because I don't want people to go waste their time to come up with a different plan. If we're saying we like the plan, but we're saying we don't want to do it by ourselves, that's two different things. I think we're saying we want to engage other people in the discussion and then decide if that is the right way forward. Because if there's other, other communities and partners who say, you know, actually, we've been thinking about something similar. We tell them what we're thinking, the staff has proposed to us, and they say, hey, have you thought about this? We, maybe we tweak it, maybe we say that's what we wanna do, but we, I don't think we've engaged enough with our partners. And like Tal said, I'll, I will, I'll love to take some of that ownership as well and not have it all on the staff come up with and I think they've done a great job with this plan I just want to do more I feel like I've, I don't know who's making smoothies <laughs> um, I guess I guess for me I struggle now because I because I do I, I see the point of what we need in order to accomplish the goals that you know that Councilman Mulligan put forward. We want to do something about the homeless camps. We want to do something about, uh, you know, the boarding up of some of these buildings and protecting our assets and all of these things. And how do we accomplish those things with the resources that we have? Can we do that with the resources that we have while we work on a more countywide solution? Um, you know, it, is that an alternative to moving down this path right now? I, I guess that's where I'm, I'm trying to figure out if that's something we can do. Mm -hmm. and kind of request where does that program stand with Middletown. 
Mm-hmm. I know they're in pain medicine, but they did ask them too because they put over $300,000 a year into that, and they stayed there. I ran it for 20 years, and they stayed there for a while, but they didn't get their fee back, but that's kind of why. So if that helps them, that's okay. And is that something where we could reach out to them and pinpoint locations and say, we yeah. need help with this location and this location and this location. These are specific problems that we have that we would like to address. We have reached out for their services um, last year when we were dealing with some of the camp issues. But again, you're saying, hey, this is where I want you to go. We're working on their time and their schedule and trying to get, so can I do it tomorrow? No. Can I do it in the next six months? Probably we'll get to where we need to be. Um, it's just a question of being able do we want to direct the, be able to direct those services or do we want to be responsible? Where have they helped Middletown? What, where have they been and when? I can tell you the two main um, occasions I've called them personally. I, I couldn't tell you everyone in Middletown, um, but I can tell you we've used them two particular occasions when we were looking at homeless camps. One was um, by the River Center line and then the other was, do you remember what the second one was? Uh, yeah, on the end of Webster there. And did they come and provide service? They um, will go out. So typically how you would handle that is if you're going to go um, empty a camp. But did they, in those instances, provide service? Yeah, so we would call them, ask them to come in. They would say, okay, we're available these days and times. They'd come out ahead of, of Public Works going to clean the camps and try and engage with people to get them into services um, and do some of that pre-work. And then, you know, the warning effectively to say, hey, in a week, Public Works is going to come through and clean this area and the police are coming through to clean this area. Um, it's just whether you want to work on their timeline or whether you want to work on a timeline. I understand what the concept is of what they do, but did they help in those circumstances and what did they do and what was the outcome? They did take names. They, they did take names. They made contacts with these people. But in 2019, we destroyed eight camps. We had public service come in, destroyed eight, eight camps. All we did was displace everybody. How Some many camps people, do we have now? More well, than eight? Like More than eight? So uh, all we did was displace them. So we had them on Water Street, we had them on Webster. All we did was destroy them, they went elsewhere. And that's the problem. We had them out there, they made their names, they said, hey, we can get you treatment, we can do this. A lot of them said no, and they continued on their way. So destroying the camps is not the answer. We can go in there next week and destroy the camps, but you can ask the courts. All we do is displace them. And then we get calls that they're downtown on Central Avenue walking around. Or in vacant housing. Because not all people want help. That's the problem. That's why by having a company or a service that actually comes out there and builds that relationship with them, and they see Victoria or Lindsay or Kathy on a regular basis, they're more willing to trust them. They're more willing to get that treatment. Just going in and destroying those camps. Uh, yeah, and I don't think that's what we're talking about, is just going in to destroy the camp. I think the question specifically was the Mental Health and Addiction Board itself. And, and they, they, that service is taken as responsible for not allowing I understand that because I was a counselor for the board. Okay. And I know how they run their counsel. And that's when the social effects start. Um, where they're responsible for their own self. I'm not saying they're doing anything wrong, but I would talk to the board Right, yeah, that's what I'm, yeah, okay. Um, have we talked about, because we were going to use CARES Act funding for this plan, mm -hmm. have we talked about alternative uses for the CARES Act funding if this plan, let's say we get to the meeting and it does not pass? for whatever reasons, what other ways could that CARES Act funding be used for to, to the same end, to the same goal? Um, I think when I asked for the um, staff report, I asked what the alternatives were in the staff report, and I can't, I'd have to go back and look and see what they were. They I were think it was do, do not plan. spend the money, do not accept the plan, you know. We have so, the same alternative. I, I'm, I'm just looking for I'm looking for more alternatives. I guess one plan, while it might be a good plan, might also not be the right plan. So I think what our responsibility is is to determine if this plan is the right plan 
Um, and it helps when there are, are good alternatives that might also be a good plan, I guess. Yeah, and you know, a Amy, Ms. Vittori was asking, you know, okay, if, if this is not what we want staff to do, what do we want them to do? I, I genuinely want a bigger approach outside of Middletown. That is my personal, I want, I want it more than Middletown. Um, I'm, I'm not saying 100% no to, to this, but that's my, that's my ask. And I think that it's been the discussion since I heard that when, before I was on council, was an ask of a bigger approach as well. Um, I know in that 2019, there was talk about county level and we still don't have the county level. And I think that's part of the issue is how long are we willing to wait and what if it doesn't come together? You know, are we gonna do nothing if we can't get something together with the county or other partners? Well, Amy, you've been a part of this conversation for a lot longer than I have. What efforts have been made towards making this a county, more of a county issue than just a Middletown issue in that time? I mean, again, after the end of 19, when we had the dust up about this November, December, I went and met with Cindy Carpenter, I think at the beginning of 2020. So, I mean, obviously COVID happened, but in that conversation, she was saying that I think there was a Fairfield group that was coming together. So, I mean, it's a lot of coalescing, it's a lot of partnerships, it's a lot of discussions. I think everyone means well, but I think it's also gonna take a long time to get to a program everyone's gonna buy into and put money into, in my mind. If we're gonna have to do what we're doing tonight times four or five, how many people are gonna to have to have these same meetings? I just wonder how long is it gonna take and is it gonna actually come together? And in the meanwhile, Middletown's going to consider, continue to inordinately or disproportionately, I think, suffer from the issue. So I think that's why I've advocated for let's do something. And especially at this time when there's money that's CARES Act funding, then we could see if, you know, maybe two things work really well out of this program and those two things we continue and we keep at the same time working towards a county solution. I absolutely agree that that would be the best answer, but I also don't know how long that could take. And it's impossible to say what would have happened if not for COVID and everything else. Absolutely. And that's just not a path you can even really go down. But, you know, can we move on from here and start to have those conversations and try to make it more of a local issue, you know, more of a regional issue than a local issue? And I think we can. I think there are steps we can make. I, absolutely we can. I think one phone call in January of 2020 doesn't constitute, and I'm not knocking you, Amy, I'm just, that's all we have referenced so far is the efforts that have been made, and I know there's been more. I think but. there's also been some references from the service providers, and I think we've had more conversations that they've just not come to fruition. Everyone says, hey, that's a wonderful idea, and then everyone sits and twiddles their thumbs. Right, so maybe we put CARES Act funding towards coming up with that wonderful idea at a bigger level. I mean, everybody's got the CARES Act funding. Uh, I mean, we just need to mobilize. Okay, well, I think some council members plan to make some phone calls and some contacts. Um, is there any other definitive, anything we want to accomplish today? I just wanna say thank you to everyone for your time and being here. Thank, thank you. you. For putting this together and, and putting together a plan and working towards a solution for a problem that we've identified. And I think hopefully we can get to actually seeing that come to fruition. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So with that being said, we will dismiss until uh, Monday. What's or month? Tuesday. March the 2nd. What, March the 2nd and um, at 5.30 p.m. here in Council Chambers. And until then, blue skies over Middletown. Thank you. Thanks.